We will now begin our first afternoon session. Uh, this session is titled, Learning from the Experiences of Other Countries. Thank you for uh, joining the conference today. And uh, my name is Baek Bom Song. Uh, I'm a research fellow at Asan Institute Policy Studies. Uh, today in this session four, uh, titled Learning from the Experience of Other Countries, uh, we have three distinguished scholars. Uh, first, Professor uh, Konstantin Gessler from the uh, Rural University in Bochum. We'll talk about the experience of Germany. And next, uh, Dr. Mirel Afa Minzi, a senior policy analyst at the International Peace Institute. We'll talk about the experience of African countries. Then we have Professor Anna Dulis uh, from the University of Western Ontario. We'll talk about the experience of Georgia. Lastly, I will talk about the experience of South Korea. Okay, each of you will have the 15 minutes uh, to speak and then uh, we will have 30 to 40 uh, minutes Q&A session. And Professor Gershon, now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for, this, uh, for the invitation to this wonderful conference. So far, I've been the one who has learned a lot, and I hope that I will be able to tell you something new and interesting, talking about my special case, about the case of German reunification and the challenge of transitional justice. In Germany, after the Second World War, two waves of transitional justice emerged. The first wave started after 1945 and referred to crimes and violence during the Nazi era. This process was largely due to the initiative of Allied occupation powers and only slowly and very reluctantly adopted by Germans themselves. Reckoning with the Nazi past has been an ongoing process until today, so we might wonder whether in this case both justice and transitional are appropriate descriptions. As a consequence of the dissolution of uh, the GDR since 1989-1990, a second wave of transitional justice took place, which aimed at the political crimes which had taken place under communist rule. The driving forces behind the process of transitional justice in East Germany were complex. On the one hand, Already during the dissolution of the GDR, part of the, uh, of the revolting East German civil society had pressed for punishment of those who had contributed to political oppression, and this went on after reunification. At the same time, however, other parts of the former East German society who had been close uh, to or even part of the system were opposed to any such claims which they co considered as an assault on their identity. For them, admitting the existence of political oppression in the GDR would have meant to admit that their lives had been wrong. And an even larger share of the East Germans, so to speak, the adjusted majority, was not interested in this issue at all. To some degree, the initiative for transitional justice in the former GDR also came from West Germany. But here again, it was not a unanimous strife given the diversity of political discourse in the Federal Republic. One argument which frequently could be heard after 1990 was that there had been deficits in the ways transitional justice referring to the Nazi era had been carried through after 1945 in West Germany, and now there might be a chance for a better performance, so to speak, a second chance for proper reckoning of the Nazi past. These remarks point to three important aspects which should be kept in mind before I start to discuss in which ways transitional justice was carried through after German reunification. First, transitional justice in unified Germany stood before the background of the experience of post-1945 transitional justice. The result was not a unidirectional path or learning process, but rather a complicated pattern marked by competition and interferences, which at least partly prolonged the cleavages of Cold War debates. Sometimes post-1945 and post-1990 transitional justice issues even directly overlapped. Some instances of transitional justice referring to the Nazi era were carried through in East Germany only after 1990, namely the restitution of Jewish property. And so this interfered with the restitution of property which was uh, taken away in the communist era. 
This points to the second aspect. Unlike after 1945, transitional justice in East Germany after reunification was part of the transformation of a socialist into a liberal society. Consequently, the change of the property regime and the restitution of private property, which had been deprived out of political motives, became a core issue. Third, reunification took place by way of accession of the GDR to the Federal Republic, which the majority of East Germans considered as the fast lane both to freedom and prosperity. Reunification did not take place as merger by means of new foundation, which the former oppositional civil society activists in the GDR mostly would have preferred. Hence, transitional justice was based on an asymmetrical situation which basically resulted in the unilateral transfer of normative and legal standards. Nevertheless, the last East German government, which had been established by the way of free elections, to some degree had been able to safeguard the interests of their East German voters in the new United Germany. We can distinguish four areas of transitional justice measures after German reunification. First, criminal justice. Second, rehabilitation and compensation. Third, lustration. And fourth, culture of commemoration. Uh, I, let me briefly explain these four aspects. Let me begin with criminal justice. Criminal justice has been the most contended aspect of transitional justice during and after German reunification. Initial steps already started during the final stage of the GDR when several individuals were accused and convicted because, because of voter fraud. Only after reunification, a comprehensive jurisdictional process started aiming at those individuals who had committed actions of political persecution. This judicial process led to preliminary investigation by public prosecution against circa 100,000 individuals out of a population of circa 15 million. The main offenses were killings at the German-German border, voter fraud, perversion of the course of justice, denunciation, atrocities of the secret police, the Stasi, mistreatment of captives, doping of athletes, important topic, misuse of authority and corruption, other economic offenses, and finally espionage. To avoid conflicts with the well-established principle of nulla purina sine lege, the trials were based on the penal code of the GDR, even while they were mostly directed by judges coming from the West. Besides, one of the legal consequences of this bizarre situation was that Erich Mielke, the director of the infamous East German security service Stasi, only was convicted for the murder of two policemen, which he had committed already in 1931 during the Weimar Republic, and not for anything which he had, had committed uh, during the GDR. Nevertheless, these trials were heavily criticized from different sides. Some former members of the GDR opposition did not feel comfortable with the subtle distinction of law and justice, which forms a pivotal feature of the liberal idea of law. So we could uh, debate whether uh, transitional justice better should uh, be labeled transitional law or whatever. Uh, why s so there was a famous diction, uh, we, we have waited for justice and we received law, we got law. Vice versa, adherents of the GDR blamed these trials as victor's justice. In the end, only 1,286 defendants actually encountered a main proceeding, and only about 750 men and only a few women were convicted. Only 40 persons received a prison sentence without parole, so starting from 100,000. Criminal justice became mostly a symbolic endeavor which served to ascertain the truth about the past. Ultimately, one might say, the outcome was closer to what we might expect from truth commissions than from criminal courts. The second aspect of transitional justice were actions aiming at the rehabilitation and compensation of victims of political violence. For that purpose, 
three laws for the revision of injustices were passed, which comprised three aspects. First, penal rehabilitation. Second, rehabilitation for administrative acts, which also contained dispossession. And third, rehabilitation of professional disadvantages. In the first category, there were about 80,000 positive decisions. In the second category, about 10,000. And in the third category, about 60,000. The benefits range from one-time payments to monthly pensions, from restitution of property to compensation, and from free scholarships to free health treatments. After long political struggles in 2007, finally, finally another federal compensation law was enacted, which granted all rehabilitated political prisoners who had spent at least six months detained in, in the GDR a monthly pension of 250 euro provided that applicants do not exceed a certain income limit. In 2010, about 37,000 persons, uh, uh, 37, persons were eligible to these payments. Yet the main problem for the victims of political violence in the GDR has been that they always have stood in the shadow of Nazi victims, namely Holocaust victims, and in some instances, instances there even has existed outright competition. To come to my third aspect, one of the most important aspects of transitional justice after German reunification has nothing to do with money but rather with archives. During its existence, the East German Security Service, the Stasi, had put hundreds of thousands of East German citizens under their surveillance and for that purpose established an enormous network of informants, colleagues, neighbors, friends and even beloved ones delivered secret reports which then often were used to the detriment of their objects of observation. After reunification, a federal agency was established for the safeguard of the Stasi files. Former Stasi victims had access to their files and very often they were deeply shocked to discover who had reported on them. It is important to see that long-lasting dictatorships of this kind establish an atmosphere of general distrust which destroys social cohesion on a very basic level and it is one of the major challenges after the end of dictatorship to overcome the resulting moral destructions and of course the contribution to the surveillance by the Stasi offers a never-ending source for political scandals since again and again political actors are blamed to have participated in that dirty game. The fourth aspect of transitional justice in Germany after reunification is the field of commemorative culture. Its importance naturally tends to increase with growing time distance to the events. The victims of political persecution in the GDR and their organizations are main actors in this field. While in their perspective, the remembrance of their fate constitutes an indispensable element of transitional justice, to some degree, they have become the object of political divisions in unified Germany, which partly extend the conflict lines of the Cold War. As in most post-communist societies, in Germany too, political groups exist which tend to downplay the suffering of the former victims of polit political violence in the GDR. Therefore, museums and monuments, especially at the sites of former prisons, have become a battlefield of contested memories. More than 20 years after reunification, we still can find that there does not exist a simple East-West division with respect to transitional justice and especially to the respective commemorative cultures. Rather, clashes representing divergent biographical and political experiences uh, from, from the time of the GDR dominate the field which become charged and sometimes even exploited from political conflicts within the now united Germany. Let me end with a brief discussion of my findings. What might be, what might be possible conclusions with regard to the Korean case? Of course, the German experience may not result, so to speak, in a best practice instruction manual. Speaking as a historian, I by nature of my discipline a natural advocate of the importance of specific circumstances. Anyhow, there might be some possible generalizations. Let me begin with a very general observation. Transitional justice in case of the unification of two divided society has to serve a double purpose. 
First, to overcome the internal divisions between supporters, opponents, and those in between inside of North Korea. Second, it has to bring together two very distinct societies. In other words, transitional justice becomes an, becomes an element of political, economic, and social integration, which makes the case even more complicated. Hence, transi transitional justice in the context of the integration of two societies should rather be considered as the construction of something new and not so much as the reestablishment of something which has existed before. This also implies the question in which manner South Korea will change as a consequence of reunification. I also want to underline an aspect which has been already mentioned by several speakers at this conference. The feasibility of transitional justice in case of a future united Korea will depend very much from the hitherto unknown circumstances of unification. Will it, be my, by, will it be by means of a confederation on equal terms, or rather by way of access, which implies a less symmetrical procedure of mutual adoption? What political bargaining power will have both sides during the process of reunification? In other words, transitional justice is not just a matter of liberal ideas, but also of power relations, since the question is who sets the standards and who controls its imposition. However, for the acceptance of transitional justice, any situation should be avoided where it might easily be blamed as a foreign imposition. Consequently, universal standards must meet local circumstances. For that purpose, we need to know the expectation of the North Korean population, and this will be no easy task since there will be many answers to that. However, there is another aspect which so far hasn't been mentioned. From a sociological point of view, transitional justice is part of a wider process. The change of elites as part of a political system change. Other than in cases when transitional justice occurs within one single society, unification of two separate societies within one state offers both the chance and the risk that the former elites of one society will be easily replaced by new elites from the other society. Replacement of elites by import, of course, technically is much easier than the complicated process either of purification or rehabilit rehabilitation of former elites or even the construction of new elites. However, the former approach also comes at a price since it might lead to an interpretation of reunification as a kind of colonial endeavor. So the punchline of my argument is that while it is important that we discuss about possible implications of transitional justice after Korean reunification, we might not be tempted to design a blueprint for a top-down process of transitional justice. Rather, we should be ready to hear what those currently living in North Korea will want when the time is ripe. In the meantime, however, transi transitional justice might work the same way as human rights have done for most of the time. As a discourse which only rarely has been translated one-to-one -one into political reality, but, but which nevertheless influences the borders of what we can think and what we can say, and thus by influencing political language also can affect political options, in other words, the imagination of the politically feasible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me uh, to this conference, and especially because I consider myself as an occasional transitional justice researcher. Uh, uh, IPI's Africa program uh, works uh, generally uh, uh, in support of uh, African institutions and actors in their peace and security uh, efforts to advance peace and security across the continent. Looking at African transitional justice processes, I would like to start by saying that since the end of the Cold War, uh, democratic governance uh, has gradually increased in most African countries with the end of one-party systems, the organization of multi-party elections, and a general opening of the political space. Despite ongoing crisis in Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, and more recently in Mali, the number of violent conflicts in Africa has reduced uh, by half since uh, in the 2000s compared to the mid-90s. Uh, in addition, the development of a continental peace and security architecture and an emerging <coughs> governance architecture has renewed African countries' commitment to promoting sustainable peace, human rights, and the rule of law across the continent. 
trying to identify uh, key lessons that can be uh, drawn from uh, transitional justice processes implemented in Africa, uh, the paper of the presentation uh, examines two main questions. Uh, what transitional justice mechanisms have been implemented across the continent and how effective have they been in achieving their objectives? And what are the conditions that have facilitated uh, the implementation of these mechanisms and what are the factors that have hindered their success? In terms of an overview of the transitional justice processes in Africa, uh, we know that transitional justice has been implemented or proposed uh, in approximately 20 African countries, uh, which made use of these processes in instances such as transitions from war to peace, from authoritarian rule to certain level of democracy, but also in the absence of clear transition from a particular conflict situation and undemocratic rule to peace and democracy. Transitional justice processes have included truth-seeking mechanisms, and they have also included justice and accountability mechanisms, including national prosecutions, international judicial processes, as well as uh, some traditional uh, restorative uh, justice uh, mechanisms or processes. Uh, the truth-seeking uh, mechanisms, we, we know about the South African uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, that operated between December 1995 and June 2002 to investigate the atrocities committed under apartheid. The South African TRC collected more than 21,000 statements from victims, received over 7,000 amnesty applications, and granted uh, amnesty to uh, uh, 1,500, and granted approximately 15, 000, uh, 1,500 amnesties. The South African TRC is often cited as a successful transitional justice process that helped in ending apartheid, avoiding a race war, and laid the basis for democracy and reconciliation. In Sierra Leone, the 1999 uh, Lomé Peace Accord established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was mandated to create an impartial record of human rights violations committed during the brutal civil war, which saw up to 75,000 people killed, 2 million others displaced, and thousands of civilians mutilated. And the commission was also mandated to address the conflict's root causes and promote reconciliation through a process of truth-telling, apology, and pardon. The Sierra Leone TRC was established in July 2002 and it presented its final report in October 2004. The commission collected over 8,000 statements from victims, perpetrators and witnesses, including women, children, amputees and ex-combatants. In Liberia, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created under the 2003 Accra Comprehensive Peace Agreement and passed into law in June 2005. The commission was charged with investigating the root causes of the Liberia's brutal war that resulted in over 250,000 deaths and the displacement of one-third of the population. It was also charged with establishing an independent and accurate record of the human rights violations occasioned by the conflict and with setting the basis for justice and reconciliation. Uh, the, the interest of the Liberian TRC uh, was the involvement of civil society, especially in the early, stages of, uh, the, the early stages of the process, which significantly impacted both the formulation of the commission's mandate and the selection of its members, ensuring that all the commissioners undergo a vetting and a public scrutiny process. However, uh, the TRC report, which was released in December 2009, has so far been uh, largely ignored by the government, uh, especially linked to issues of credibility of the, the commission. Uh, recent truth-seeking mechanisms have also been uh, implemented in Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire recently following uh, post-election uh, violence in Kenya after the 2007-2008 uh, violence and uh, uh, the negotiation process led by uh, former Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan, which agreed on the creation of various mechanisms including a commission on inquiry on post-election violence, an independent review commission on the elections, a national ethnic and race relations commission, and a truth, justice, and reconciliation commission. 
the Kenyan TGR, which has submitted its report uh, this week uh, to uh, the, the new president, uh, was mandated to establish a complete picture of the causes, nature, and extent of the post-election violence, including unresolved injustices such as the distribution of land and state's resources, and to contribute towards national unity, reconciliation, and healing in Kenya. Uh, it has been observed that the TJRC uh, failed to mobilize uh, civil society and the media, and it's considered to have lacked a sense of uh, public ownership. In Côte d'Ivoire, where uh, there was also uh, violence following the November 2010 presidential election, a three-month uh, international commission of inquiry was first established by the UN Human Rights Council before a six-month national commission created uh, in June 2011 and tasked with providing conclusions on how and why massive human rights violations occurred and identifying individuals who should be uh, subject to uh, criminal prosecution. In addition to these uh, inquiry mechanisms, uh, the president, President Alassane Ouattara, appointed 11 members to a Dialogue, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which is due to submit uh, its final report by September 2013. Concerns have already been raised about the insufficient definition of the Dialogue, dialogue Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's mandate, its unclear relation with ongoing prosecution efforts, as well as the limited guarantee to preserve its independence from the political power. In addition to truth-seeking processes, African countries in transition have implemented justice and accountability mechanisms. Uh, prosecutions have facilitated the progressive development of international criminal law, including by clarifying uh, legal issues such as uh, rape as war crime. And in post-conflict context, uh, national prosecutions has also, uh, ho also have the potential to help uh, reconstruct justice systems that were undermined by war and enhance the capacity of national lawyers and officials. However, this is true uh, when a minimal justice system survived the conflict. And in the case of Rwanda, after the, geno the genocide, it's, it's often reported that only 10 lawyers uh, survived, and uh, they, most of them Oh, most of them had been killed during the genocide. All, only 10 lawyers had, were left in the country after the genocide because most of them had been killed or had left uh, or fled the country uh, following uh, the atrocity. In addition to the lack of uh, capacity, local infrastructures were also pillaged or heavily damaged, and the entire system, justice system, uh, was to be rebuilt with over 100,000 people accused of genocide and incarcerated, the Rwandan authorities estimated at the time that it will take over 150 years to try all the suspects. In terms of uh, national uh, accountability mechanisms, uh, the military justice system is competent in the DRC to handle cases of serious crimes committed by the national army, armed groups, and civilians. Uh, while only few cases have been brought to justice, especially in comparison with the significant number of massive human rights abuses, including sexual, sexual gender-based violence, the military justice system is considered the main legal tool and accountability mechanisms to end uh, impunity in the country. Uh, despite uh, international, uh, international communities' uh, support, the Congolese military system remains, however, challenged by factors that include its institutional weaknesses and ineffective legislative framework that often contravenes both the national constitution and international standards on the right to a fair trial, as well as issues of military and political interference. These limitations to the fight against impunity, combined with limited political will, have in some cases emphasized the need for international prosecution mechanisms. In Rwanda, the UN Security Council established the ICTR in 1994 to prosecute the persons bearing the greatest responsibility for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law committed between January and December 1994. Uh, some of the achievements of the ICTR include the groundbreaking Akayesu judgment, which was the first conviction for genocide by an international court, the first punishment of sexual violence in an internal conflict, and the first time war, uh, rape was found to be an act of uh, genocide. In uh, 2013, the ICTR has completed its work and the trial, 
trial level and trial level with respect to 92 of the 93 persons uh, accused. And some of the trials are still uh, in appeal, being considered in appeal, or have been transferred uh, to national prosecutions. The tribunal, the ICTI, is considered to have given a voice to thousands of victims, having heard over 26,000 hours of testimony from more than 3,200 witnesses. Uh, the tribunal, it was mentioned this morning, was initially criticized for its location in Arusha, Tanzania. And current challenges include the completion of uh, pending cases. The tribunal is supposed to uh, close business, I would say, by the end of uh, next year. Uh, another challenge is the preparation of its archives and the handover to the residual mechanism, mechanism that has been established by the Security Council. In Sierra Leone, where the post-war domestic judiciary was described as weak and partisan, uh, lessons learned from the beginnings of the ICTR uh, has le led to the establishment of a mixed tribunal located within the country to help rebuild the national ju uh, judicial system and enable the whole population to follow its proceedings. The Special Court of Sierra Leone was created by a 2002 agreement between the UN and the government of Sierra Leone, pursuant to Security Council Resolution 1315. The court was mandated to try those who were the greatest responsibility for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other serious violations of international law committed from uh, November 1996. Despite its innovative uh, hybrid nature at the time of its creation and the success of its outreach program, among other achievements, uh, some of the weaknesses of the Special Court of Sierra Leone uh, have been highlighted as the limited uh, engagement by uh, the, the local population and the limited, and this is general, I would say, to uh, uh, international uh, prosecution uh, mechanisms, the limited number of trials uh, completed. Eight uh, trials have been completed by the court, and uh, Charles Taylor, the former president of Liberia, uh, is uh, in appeal in, in the Hague. The first uh, case, the, the fight sorry, against impunity by the international community has gained a new impetus uh, with the entry into force of the Rome Statute establishing uh, the ICC. Uh, the ICC, uh, the Rome Statute, has been ratified by 34 African countries, and as of May uh, 2013, the court has initiated investigations in 18, uh, cases, con uh, 18 cases concerning eight situations, all in Africa. Uh, we know that the arrest, uh, arrest warrants issued against Sudanese President uh, Omar al-Bashir has strained the relationship uh, between the ICC and the African Union, and we'll see what happens with uh, the, the last case, uh, Uru Kenyatta. Uh, the AU is already trying to uh, uh, organize like, uh, <laughs> resistance against the, the, the process or the, the trial. And uh, this resistance of uh, some African leaders to the ICC illustrates demands for regional and national accountability processes rather than uh, exogenous uh, ones. It's reflected in the development of a continental transitional justice policy framework by the African Union, which reaffirms the AU's commitment complementarily with the ICC to end impunity and promote justice and reconciliation in Africa by popularizing credible homegrown justice mechanisms that can deal with impunity and advance reconciliation in a way that is consistent with acceptable international standards. The same resistance is also uh, reflected in efforts to revive traditional accountability mechanisms, such as uh, the Mato Put that uh, was uh, uh, implemented in northern Uganda to address or to deal with the suffering caused by the decades-long armed conflict waged uh, by the Lord Resistance Army. And also in Rwanda, we already mentioned the Gachacha courts that were, uh, were set up throughout the country and based on uh, traditional mechanisms such as public confessions to establish the truth by confronting uh, oral statements. Uh, however, these local accountability processes, initially established to handle minor crimes and family disputes, were not necessarily equipped to address legacies of mass human rights abusers, and the gachacha system has often been criticized by human rights groups. 
than like the modern and uh, uh, presumably like top-down traditional justice processes, traditional accountability mechanisms have also proved to be learned from the various processes implemented in Africa, which can benefit processes in the region, and especially looking at North Korea, I won't uh, pretend to be an expert on Korea, uh, and I wouldn't uh, uh, touch on that, but like, I would just uh, list the main lessons or the main factors that have uh, enabled, I would say, some uh, effectiveness of the African transitional justice processes. The first one is the importance of the context that was already mentioned. And uh, South Africa, in South Africa, the success of the TRC uh, is, has been explained by the fact that the commission was divided uh, to respond, devised to respond to a particular post-apartheid context where amnesty was part of a political compromise between the ANC and the outgoing national uh, party government. And uh, another specificity of the, the South Africa uh, society was the, 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 the emphasis uh, put on uh, forgiveness due to the country's uh, religious and cultural uh, values. And uh, uh, we know the notion of Ubuntu, where, yes, I am uh, because uh, we are. Uh, replicated in post-conflict Sierra Leone, where strategies of recovery and reintegration uh, pre-existed, the TRC uh, arguably uh, received initially limited support, and uh, because people considered that it was established mostly due to pressure from local NGOs and human rights activists, and the process ignored uh, local practices of healing and social coexistence, which did not actually favor truth-telling and undertook to reverse people's preference for a forgive and forget approach. And if we compare with the situation in Rwanda, where the end of the genocide and the return to peace resulted from the uh, RPF's uh, military victory over the Hutu regime, the new government was under no uh, pressure to compromise. This was reinforced by the severe uh, discredit of the religious model of forgiveness and reconciliation. I think my time is up which uh, followed the church's implication in the genocide. It resulted uh, initially uh, in a strong emphasis on prosecutions before the government uh, acknowledged the need for some measures of restorative justice to address the country's legacy of mass atrocity. I think we also uh, spoke about uh, popular, the importance of popular participation in transitional justice processes because uh, civil society plays an important role, in, can play an important role in the conception, design, functioning, monitoring and review of transitional uh, justice processes, thus facilitating sustainability, building credibility and local ownership. South Africa again is another example. We also talked about uh, Liberia where civil society was uh, instrumental in uh, the selection and the definition of the mandate of the, the, the commission. In Côte d'Ivoire, recently, civil society's uh, limited participation in the process of selecting members of the Dialogue, Truth and Reconciliation Commission has raised concerns about the commission's independence from the president and the commitment to impartially implement uh, its mandate. I think the, the need to empower marginalized and vulnerable groups have been, has been highlighted, especially with regard to women and children, and the, the TRC in Sierra Leone was uh, an example of uh, involvement or taking into account both the, the role uh, women played in the, during the conflict and that probably uh, change or transform their participation in the post-conflict uh, society and also provided an opportunity for children to, uh, uh, test, uh, to give testimony about their roles uh, as uh, ex-combatant but also as uh, uh, adequate resources of, uh, uh, of a transitional justice process, sorry, and uh, the political economy of uh, transitional justice processes is another element of the effectiveness. And uh, in Liberia, uh, insufficient financial, human and material resources uh, have uh, somehow hindered uh, the effectiveness of uh, the transitional justice, uh, uh, the TRC, while in South Africa, where well, the budget of the commission was annually uh, some $18 million and the commission established uh, over uh, 400, uh, uh, several offices in the region and was able to employ 400 people, uh, the, the, the means or the resources allocated to the commission also contributed to its effectiveness. 
And finally, this morning, we talked about political will, commitment, and even leadership of the, the political authorities, the government, and uh, the, 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 the mechanisms itself as a key element of uh, its effectiveness. Um, in South Africa, in terms of political will and commitment, I think one of the, the weaknesses of the, the TRC was found in the in the reparations. First, the, the committee that had to deal with reparations, re, with reparations was the least equipped of the commission, but also the, the government didn't follow up in uh, allocating or in paying the reparations that were recommended by the commission. And besides reparations, the issue of prosecution uh, or the non-implementation of the recommendations of the TRC with regard to prosecution has been seen as one of the weaknesses of the the South African TRC, and another example of like, limited or relative implementation of uh, TRC recommendations uh, can be found uh, in Sierra Leone. I think I will conclude there, like uh, offer my time, and hoping that these, uh, these factors that have been uh, uh, highlighted in Africa or that uh, has been, have been drawn from African transitional justice processes can be helpful in uh, devising uh, transitional justice mechanisms in Korea. Thank you. Should I go? Yes. So I understand that I'm the last speaker, which is always a <laughs> tough task. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Anna Dolite. I currently teach international law in University of Western Ontario in Canada but I was born and raised and practiced law in the country of Georgia. So you would have to engage in a mental exercise of trans transferring yourself immediately to a, a, absolutely, a relatively different continent, Eastern Europe, Europe, Eurasia, however we would like to call it. And so today uh, I would like to uh, present, talk relatively briefly, I hope, about my uh, own experience of tinkering with the idea of transitional justice in the realm of pol policy making and a hope, with the hope that uh, we can draw some lessons which could be applicable not just in a particular con continent, but everywhere, uh, with, uh, with certain modifications. And so somebody would ask, why is this important? Because I think it's important because for an organization like Asan Institute, policymakers, uh, scholars who generate ideas, whose business is to generate ideas. It is important to understand the feasibility of these ideas, map the actors uh, who are, can facilitate their implementation, can hinder, can act as spoilers, uh, as well as take into account and plan for certain risks that will arise. So that I, I hope for the utility, for this kind of utility for my presentation. <coughs> Uh, picking up from themes that were echoed yesterday and were mentioned today, the dilemma between prosecuting everyone and amnestying everyone, choosing between peace, justice, interests of victims, I wanted, I went back in my thinking to the essay by Ernest Renan, a, a French theologian and legal scholar, and the essay is called What is a Nation? Right? It defines nation building, what's needed for an establishment of a nation state. And one of the quotes that he, uh, he says that I would like to bring from his essay is the following. Forgetting, I would even go so far as to say historical error is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation, which is why progress in historical studies often constitutes a danger for the principle of nationality. So just this, this, this quote and this essay, his whole search for the balance between forgetting and remembering, the exercise in which a nation state in or, it has to engage in order to build itself, um, I think flips a little bit some of the themes that have been mentioned in this conference and it's something that has to be taken into account in the process of transitional justice. And I would move beyond that by saying that this, it is the function of transitional justice mechanisms to facilitate the strategic decision making between forgetting and memory. And this is how I approached the idea of establishing transitional justice in mechanism in Georgia currently in 2000, after 2012. And, uh, and uh, this is what I'll reflect on today. And so, so from my own experience in throwing out this idea, borrowing from the experience specifically of Argentina, CONADAP, the Commission for the Investigation of the Disappeared, uh, and suggesting that it should be brought into Georgia to deal with the crimes and human rights violations committed from 2004 to 2012, I discovered that there are six factors, six uh, groups or six interests that one has to take into account or will encounter 
after one throws out the idea of transitional justice in the public space or public debate. So something that hypothetically could follow essence discuss putting out a publication on establishing transitional justice mechanisms. So what are the six factors? The first one is the number of violations, and I'll expound this briefly, about this briefly in the presentation. The second one, second one was elaborated up, upon today in the previous panel this morning is the external actors, the diversity, multiplicity, and their interests, and sometimes the clash between the interests of the of the, of the public, of the people, and in the, between the, and the interest of the international actors. The third one, the nature of the transition and the nature of the power sharing agreement, it was mentioned upon here, the constraints in which the new government finds itself. The fourth one, the factor of the region, Professor Titel spoke about this in this morning, the regionalization and the impact that any transitional justice process will have upon the region and the regimes in the region. Justice cas cascade versus the lack thereof. The, the fifth one is vernacularization, translating the ideas of transitional justice into a language which is understandable, appealable to local people and should be adopted by local people. And the sixth is the factor of time. So let me briefly provide the background of, about the country about which I'm talking. So we are talking about the country of five million, and I did my homework yesterday, that's half of the size of Seoul. <laughs> so it's a small territory, and there are certain uh, problems and, advas and advantages which come from the fact that it's a small country, social bond, bond is much tighter, everybody knows everybody, uh, we have to take this into account. Plus that, the country emerged from Soviet Union in 1990, and it did not have as many countries in, the, in Eastern Europe, it did not have a fully fledged, effective lustration, decommunization process. It didn't. And the third factor is, and the most important one, that the regime that came into power in 2004 through a popular revolution dubbed the Rose Revolution engaged in rapid reforms, as uh, borrowing David Mitrani's word, it has proceeded very, very fast, but not that well. So it engaged in rapid reforms, but has committed serious violations on its way. So some of the, the picture that we have encountered after the regime left in 2012 as a result of popular and peaceful elections has been the following. Uh, number of markers that mark the system. The policy of zero tolerance resulted in the tripling of the prison population over eight years. The only other country where this has ever happened is the United States. Uh, and in 2011, Georgia occupi occupied the fourth highest rate of per capita prison population in the world. 99% uh, conviction rate. Any person that would find him or herself in a justice system would be, was destined for conviction. Highly increased and constantly growing rate of individuals under probation. Uh, a growing rate of the use of lethal force by police, so death of unarmed suspects and also widespread torture and inhuman and degrading treatment within prisons, and uh, turn to punitive sentencing in, and incarceration policies. And what is noteworthy, the very fact of torture within the prison is that concluded the regime of the United Nations, United National Movement, the party that was in power. So on September 18, two, two weeks before the elections, a video of prison torture was leaked that galvanized the population, which had many grievances already, and then the government was, the people went out to elections and the government was brought down, basically. So there is, a, there is an aspect of this. The main slogan of the demonstration, which is important for the, for, 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 for the advocates of transitional justice, was the system must be destroyed. Not we need economic reforms, not we need more employment. The system might be destroyed. I think they were referring to the punitive and repressive system of criminal justice. Okay. It's in the circumstances, uh, right as uh, the new, new government came into power, that they, the first promise that they gave was that every culprit uh, from the previous government would be, pro would be punished adequately. And, it, and, in, and they started immediately in, in the realm of policymaking the search for adequate processes to remedy, uh, to, to uh, fulfill that task. Some things have been done, like reform of the role, of the laws, reform of the justice system. Uh, so it's in this realm that I suggested, well, uh, having been educated. Here I think that there's a causality between well, how, how I and people, like my colleagues, know about this. I suggested, well, why don't we establish a transitional justice commission? And there's a particular reason and rationale 
why I suggested for this to be the, the, uh, the, the model for this to be the Argentinian Commission. Uh, I thought it blended very well with, the, with Georgian customs of, uh, customs of uh, decision-making by elders, but I apparently did not explain it very well to the public, it seems, and I'll talk about this later. I thought the, uh, the collective decision-making by the commission, there were 13 members, if I'm not mistaken, having nine people in Georgia, and also it was the writer of the, uh, who was a prominent writer, who, Ernesto Sabato, who headed the Argentinian commission, and I thought, what Georgians need now at this point is not another lawyer, like me pushing for more prosecution, but somebody who will steer the process of truth, reconciliation, and prosecution in the name of nation building and moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened with this idea and what, is, what, are, what are the things that I have learned? First, the degree of violations which are uncovered after any dictatorial regime leaves move beyond a, imagination, moved beyond the preparation that one might take, one might make before the transition happens. The degree of, as uh, Roberta Cohen mentioned this in, the, in the lunch talk today, the degree, we, we know from after the fall of fascism, we know, we, talk, uh, we had a presenter yesterday about North Korea, we, we imagined, we always imagined the horrendous crimes that have been committed, but in Georgia we found that whatever you, whatever you think has to be multiplied by 10. The severity, the, uh, the, um, the and horrendous character of, and, and the way the crimes have been, have been devised is, uh, high, is highly unpredictable. So, so in terms of policy making, one, uh, one uh, lesson that one can draw from this fact is that there will always be place for policy experimentation. No matter how we prepare for transition, or no matter how, with how many ideas we come up in relation to what's going to happen, do we need a commission, do we need, what do we do with the education system, there will be always a place for policy experimentation, a place to respond to the information uncovered, uh, newly uncovered. In terms of categories of, of external actors, so Georgia is a small country, it doesn't have much influence in international relations, and it's highly dependent, uh, dependent and it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's highly dependent on foreign aid, especially aid from the United States of America, and it's uh, often influenced to a high degree by criticism from foreign countries and international organizations. This has to be taken into account. But in terms of categorization of what kind of actors can we anticipate is, one, it's international organizations. Right? We've talked about UN, but also regional organizations and their degree of interference will be determined by what kind of relations a country has established with them. So naturally, we did not see activity of, by ASEAN in Georgia. Right? I don't think many people expected it. But we did see activism by European Union and especially NATO, mm. especially when the first public officials of the previous regime started to be arrested. The NATO uh, Secretary General made a public critical statement saying this is selective justice in, because s strong relations had, be, had been formed between those international organizations and Georgia's previous leadership because Georgia had tried to approximate itself to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Second is states. Of course, the states which are the allies of countries where transitional justice would happen will have more influence, will have more say, and will have more interest to, uh, to influence. Um, of course, uh, and also what is important, of course, is the role that these states have played in the transition itself. In, in Georgia, we, we, we can guess that the United States was instrumental in facilitating peaceful transition in October. So there are particular stake, stakes for countries which are allies of countries where transitional processes take place to, uh, to, um, to influence the processes or steer them. Media, in the case of Georgia, Washington Post, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, The Economist were very active in making uh, op-eds, editorials, statements uh, on the processes of prosecution and justice in Georgia, and we have to expect that the media will be active, there will be editorials and, um, and opinion pieces. And of course, NGOs, in case of Georgia, we had Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Surpri they were not surprisingly creative in their approaches to the processes because they were taken by surprise with the transition, that's, that's my view, but they did, more and more we see their, their policy positions on what was supposed to have happened in relation to transition and uh, accountability. In terms of the nature of the new regime, I think the power sharing is, agreement is instrumental. One of the reasons wh why the Georgian government, the new one, cannot have its full way in implementing the justice and accountability program is because it is placed in a power sharing agreement. The, the president, uh, the leader of the party, 
which, of the, which, which is implicated in abuses, is the president, is still the president of the country. He will be the president before the October. So, so a little bit like Zimbabwe, there is a power sharing in, agreement in place, and this has to be taken into account in assessing what a government can do and can't do. Yes. In terms of the regional context, we, I, was, I was told in, in, the, in the Georgian media discussions about this transitional justice mechanism, beware whatever will happen in Georgia with the previous regime will be taken into account by the authoritarian countries in the neighborhood. And this is certainly true. We know that after Rose Revolution, Orange Revolution, and Tulip Revolutions have happened in the region, many countries, including Russia, has tightened their, their grip on, uh, on liberal uh, organizations with liberal agendas from the fear of another revolution. So that uh, regional factor is highly important, and what might be good for a country might not be good for the region. Vernacularization, it is important. I think one of my, uh, my own suggestions problem was that it wasn't really couched or understood or framed as in terms of Georgian uh, structures of meaning. Uh, the idea of bringing something from Argentina was very foreign. And I, I, don't, I don't think we, I specifically uh, did a very good job of translating this, this, this idea into uh, something that would be appealed to local public. And this is not, not, not a mistake which is not committed uncommonly. Right? And the question of time, and that's my last point, uh, and this is why it's re directly related to the uh, role of think tanks, I think. The question of time. Uh, it's not only, Professor Ndulo mentioned earlier, that international justice takes time. Local justice, if, do, if done properly, takes time too. To, and very often with these crimes, there is no time. Victims, as soon as the power transfer happens, victims will be at your door demanding justice. This is what happened in, in Georgia. Uh, the other point, of course, is that the individuals who, see, who uh, perceive that they will be prosecuted will leave the country. This is what happened in Georgia. Second day, the left number of public officials have left the country. So it's important to have adequate cooperation with Interpol, with other countries, to be ready for this. That's why it becomes pressing to put these processes in place in, in time. And we've, we've, he we've heard also how transitional processes uh, themselves, the commissions, take time. Sierra Leone was two years. In Argentina, it was record time. It was nine months. But in Georgia, in, in October, the government was, telling, was, was saying, well, we don't have time even for nine months. We have to start delivering right now, otherwise people are angry. Hmm. So here, where I would like to connect this to my my final point about ASEAN, although we might think that this, the idea of uh, unification of Korea is not going to happen tomorrow, I think it is the role of scholars and think tanks to be uh, prepared for uh, and to have the ideas on the shelves uh, for the time when they might be relevant. Because from my experience, if you start working on the idea, on the reform idea, once the political opening happens, it's already too late. Thank you. At the same time, there is also the immediate problem we may confront in post-unification period. The perception uh, of South Koreans imposing a form of victor's justice. This is because it is likely that no South Koreans will be subject to uh, prosecution or punishment under the uh, transi transitional justice mechanisms. Or, uh, nor should they be if they have not done something nothing wrong. And it can forever uh, entrench a division between the North and South, even if unification is being sought and the people of the North want justice. In addition, given the tragedy of the two Korea's uh, modern history and the long-standing political polarization on both sides, the process of establishing and implementing transitional justice mechanisms can be extremely uh, politicized. Therefore, it is necessary to have a public consensus on the appropriate uh, implementation of transitional justice mechanisms because justice, rule of law, and human rights cannot be rooted in the society unless its own people recognize its values, their values. If, if the normative consciousness on transitional justice is not uh, widely uh, shared by the members of a society, uh, there is little possibility for its uh, mechanisms to actually be implemented. implemented. In this sense, our paper, uh, me and Lisa, Lisa and uh, Yuri, uh, will discuss the South Korea's experience of implementing transitional justice since 1987, June's struggle, and the important role of the civil society. 
Though our empirical research project is still in an early stage, the South Korean case shows that the role of civil society is extremely important, not only in creating the political will for, for the establishment of traditional justice mechanisms, but also in ensuring its implementation. Many of you know already that the South Korea has experienced the drastic transforma transformation of the rule of law. For a great deal of time uh, of its history, the country had a monarchy and democracy was far from the Korean collective consciousness. Then during the colonial era, it was nearly impossible for Koreans to foster appropriate human rights. Afterwards, the Korean War further damaged the human rights consciousness in Korea. Then there was a military coup. The military government ruled the country uh, for 30 years, and it was not until the end of 1980s that the democracy returned. And following democratization, South Korean government has started dealing with the problems of past history by setting up government-level truth commissions. And over a decade, South Korea has pursued uh, transitional justice by creating 17 uh, truth commissions, rather than emphasizing compensations for victims or punishing perpetrators. And they are formed mostly on ad hoc basis in response to growing political and social pressures during the deepening democracy in the late 1990s and on into the early part of the last decade. And although the, those the truth commission's objective and outcomes may differ uh, uh, widely, South Korean's uh, TRCs have dealt with the problems of past history which can be categorized uh, into three types. First, the anti-national activities before and during the Japanese colonial rule. Second, the massacres during and after the Korean War. And third, the grave human rights violations by the authoritarian uh, military regime. And today I do want to share with you three important uh, features in the relationship between civil society and TRCs in South Korea. First, the establishment of TRCs uh, could not have occurred without the persistent uh, struggle of civil society, including uh, local human rights activities. For example, compared to other legislative process in Korea, the process to adopt the 2005 Basic Act for coping with past history for truth and reconciliation is recognized as a very unusual one because of an active participation by and debate between civil society, government officials, and politicians. There are many proposals from various actors which inevitably uh, draw public attention and cause tensions between political parties. And lastly, look, uh, took over almost two years until the Basic Act was adopted. This was a rare case in the restorative history of Korea where civil society has uh, been actively involved in the restorative process uh, from the draft to its adoption. It is our contention that uh, at the very least, the whole restorative process for the establish establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Korea, TRCK, shows the possibility of social change on the issues of transitional justice in Korea with an active intervention and participation from civil society. Second, cooperation with the civil society has also been vital for the effectiveness of commissions because it can monitor the institution's performance and at the same time benefit from using the knowledge, experience, and expertise of the civil society, including the human rights NGOs. For example, there are many different NGOs which represent uh, children, women, prisoners, veterans, and so on. And they have been a source of information for TRCK by providing uh, expertise and witnesses on the past atrocities in the local communities. That is, the cooperation between these various NGOs and TRCK has provided a wide spectrum of uh, transitional issues to discuss, and this process ensured the effective implementation of transitional uh, justice. Overall, such a close relationship between TRCK and civil society has contributed to the strengthening of the national system for transitional justice. And lastly, the experience of TRCK since its establishment shows that it is very hard to set up the appropriate relationship with the civil society and other governmental institutions, though a tension between those two groups appears quite natural.
That is the National Assembly, uh, the political parties, mass, uh, mass media, human rights NGOs, and academia, for example, all had different interests and voices. Therefore, one of the important conditions for the TRC case effectiveness was not so much in its neutrality and independence, but its interdependence to all related stakeholders, including civil society. Okay, uh, now I would want to very briefly describe any implications for the post-unification Korea. Already uh, Dr. Bong uh, uh, pointed out yesterday uh, in a recent uh, public survey by our, by our institute, the majority of South Koreans answered that in unified Korea, the expected degree of reconciliation among the people of South and North is low. And we believe that this highlights the important role that civil society should play for the reconciliation and peace building in a unified Korea. And second, it is necessary for not only to establish an official and complete uh, historical record, but also to share it with the public for a unified Korea. The testimonies and the crimes committed by perpetrators and illegal institutional conduct of government should be disclosed openly to the public. The reports of the commission should be disseminated widely and public discussions on the issue should be held to make the best use of the outcomes. And civil society can and should play the central role for this. Lastly, civil society in North Korea is certain to play an important role in creation and implementation of transitional justice mechanisms in the post-unification period. At the beginning of the unification, North Korean civil society's contribution to this process can be limited because civil society in North Korea might be underdeveloped. Therefore, ample time for uh, North Korean civil society to cooperate with the commission is necessary in order to successfully uh, cultivate a public awareness, awareness of the importance of the transitional justice uh, in unified Korea. For example, uh, I think the international NGOs which, had, uh, which have the underground experience after years of operating in North Korea should help foster uh, civil society in North Korea in the initial stage after unification because they will likely be viewed with less suspicion by local uh, North Koreans. Overall, the peace building and reconciliation in post-unification Korea cannot be the responsibility of the government alone. The, with the active involvement, cooperation, and participation of a civil society, which has the greatest contact with and trust of a social, uh, local communities, the uh, unified Korean government can successfully design and implement uh, transitional justice to be responsive, responsive to people's needs, preferences, and priorities. That's it. Thank you, and I would like to open up the Q&A. And yes, we will have uh, 30 minutes. And if I may ask you, please identify yourself. Yes. This is Professor Drossler. I think like a lot of Westerners coming into this conference had the, the, the example of Germany very much in our heads and imagining that would be the template uh, for what would happen in Korea. After two days of this conference, I'm almost convinced that that's not going to be the template. Based on your experience in Germany, not expecting you to be a Korea expert, uh, do you sort of have the same prediction and I keep thinking of that incredible movie that was made about after German reunification of the top Stasi agent, agent who ended up being a postman. The lives of others. Yeah. Yeah. Lives of others. Uh, can you imagine such a scenario? Or, or the South Koreans, as talented as they are in the arts, a uh, movie that's going to have the same kind of ending. <laughs> Okay, I'm 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 not qualified to say anything about uh, the Korean art of movie, but uh, I 
I share your impression. So when I, when I came here, I was already skeptical about uh, the chance to consider Germany as a template. But the more I, you, the more I learn uh, during this conference, the more convinced I become that. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, our experience won't be too helpful. So I have tried to identify certain elements uh, which, which, which might be uh, well, helpful, where, where, one, where we can identify problems of a more general nature. But uh, there are so many specific circumstances. So I think the, basic, uh, the core element is uh, the East German society and the North Korean societies are very, very uh, distinct. So there, uh, there was something like an emerging civil society in uh, East Germany since at least uh, the 1980s. And so uh, part of uh, the evolution was due to what uh, East Germans uh, produced themselves. Of course, I, I don't want uh, to, to simplify things. That, uh, the whole situation and whole development had a lot to do with the international developments. But um, there were people who were uh, uh, making arguments, who, who were uh, uh, speaking in public. They were able to use Western media and so, and so on. In a way, there was a, a discourse uh, which uh, went back and forth um, from East Germany to West Germany and so on. And uh, another thing, another aspect is, I think if you uh, compare the two systems from uh, uh, their, from the aspect of, of criminal uh, potential or, or from their violence. So you, you cannot compare uh, the GDR of the 1980s with uh, uh, today's North Korea. So maybe you should go back to the early 50s and the Stalinist era so you might ca get a closer picture. But uh, um, this is quite uh, distinct. And so far, uh, I think what, what we can draw from the comparison is rather uh, that uh, the, the more general conclusion which I try to, to bring closer to you that uh, it, it, it won't not just change the other society, it will change your own society. So, and, 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 and so I think we can, can – maybe it's, it's more interesting to, to look at uh, uh, the transformation processes which took place in Europe and the European uh, Union after 1990. So maybe uh, experiences of uh, integration and transformation are more helpful for your case than uh, – uh, experiences of transitional justice. Okay, thank you for this very interesting question. Um, I have two questions. Uh, both of them are uh, because I've been uh, fighting for you for the last two days, yeah, so uh, kind of. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we are uh, always going back to the point that there is no uh, civil society in North America, in North America, in North uh, Korea. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, that uh, um, you will have a civil society formed of uh, victims' groups, and that's the kind of civil society you need for transitional justice to, uh, to take place. Now, I would caution with civil society because in Eastern Europe we are, you know, we we have a positive um, uh, perspective on uh, civil society, but in Eastern Europe there are very interesting groups that oppose <coughs> transitional justice. You know, and you don't quite want them in the picture. In a way, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering what uh, your perspective on uh, good and bad civil society in uh, in uh, the Korean uh, context is. And then, um, you know, I have a question. Yeah, I have another take on uh, on uh, one statement that was made uh, in the conference yesterday when um, uh, the the implication was uh, that is it is futile for us to talk about transitional justice. Uh, uh, in North Korea while we don't know the mode of transition. Um, and I would say that if the mode of transition, if the exit from communism in North Korea is a violent one, then North Korea or the successor state, North Korean or uh, uh, United uh, Korean uh, uh, successor state, will have to deal with two pasts, actually. Yeah? The communist past and the legacy of atrocities related to the mode of transition, be it civil war, revolution, coup d'etat, whatever you want to 
genocidal, whatever, you know. Um, and I would say that of all cases that I know of countries with multiple pasts, yeah, they have tended to see these multiple pasts as being separate and being um, uh, and being distinct. Why? Because the nature of repression is different. You will never address um, communist, the, com the legacies of the communist regime with the same transitional methods as you address conflict uh, related to the mode of transition. You know, um, I know only of one example, and I would like. Konstantin and uh, Anna to, um, uh, to think of, if you know in, in uh, Germany and Georgia and uh, the former uh, Soviet uh, Union of, of similar cases, I know only of one case, the Presidential uh, Inquiry Commissions in uh, the Baltic States, which were transitional justice um, mechanisms that dealt with multiple pasts at the same time, the Nazi and Soviet occupation. But all the other transitional justice policies and programs were designed, were parallel, yeah? Were in parallel designing um, uh, redress for the Nazi and communist past, or the uh, Georgian-Russian uh, war and the communist past, or the Romanian revolution and the communist uh, past in Romania. So I would say that actually it, it is high time for us to discuss uh, transitional justice related to communist, to the communist crimes in North Korea. And I agree with Anna that we have to do it now because if, uh, if the exit from communism takes place, it's too late. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think every group or the, not only the civil society from the victims, but also the, the groups who is opposed to, who is against the transitional justice process should be heard. Because the public consensus is important, because transitional justice itself is to, has a direction toward the reconciliation and peace building. So every civil society groups and the local communities should be heard and through the, and raise the public honest and the discussions can make certain public uh, consensus on the way in which the transitional justice mechanisms work in unified Korea. This I can say. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, so, my argument would be that uh, transitional justice can operate as a kind of of of, uh, of door opener to memories. Yeah? So, if you start with one aspect of the past, uh, other groups will use it for their own purposes. And so we have different examples. So uh, within societies, you can several times, uh, you, you can often find a situation where there are deserving victims and undeserving victims. And so this is depending from political circumstances, who will be accepted as a, a deserving victim and who will, who will be not accepted, who will be considered as an undeserving victim. So uh, sometimes, uh, the so-called, I uh, will label them, the undeserving victims will use uh, tr compensation or transitional justice for the uh, uh, deserving victims to bring forward their own case. So you could see this in Germany in, in the 1990s. There was a campaign for compensation for forced uh, laborers from uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, the German public was very favorable to this. Uh, but uh, the reason behind was that uh, they thought, um, well, if we take up this uh, situation, this challenge, afterwards we will be able to talk about uh, German uh, POWs who also had been uh, prisoners of war after the war. So this should be a door opener to our own victimhood. And in Eastern Europe, as you know, so there, there took place a competition between uh, the Holocaust memory and the memory to communism. And so this was a very delicate situation because this was a kind of official uh, Europeanization of commemoration. So this was, it was, in a way, it was expected by Eastern Europeans, if you want to be like us, you have to have a Holocaust memory. So, and, and in a way, they ref, uh, refused, and, and so they said, well, we've got a different memory, and, and so this was a, uh, I'm telling you things a you know better, when, a, competing a, a, a competing person. So, uh, so um, 
to, to get back to my initial argument, so uh, you, you can, uh, if you establish such a discourse, yeah, it's in the world, and different groups can adopt this discourse and use it for uh, different purposes. And so uh, I think the picture of door opener helps to explain this mechanism. Yes. I think it's a very it's a very interesting question in terms of multiple paths and I guess what kind of governance mechanisms the governments in power use to structure the grievances of particular groups, right? So uh, in Georgia we have seen, and in my paper it's listed in detail, but we have seen it's a tiny country, but for a small country, first the process and procedure related to property restitution of victims of communism induced and facilitated by Georgia's membership in the European Convention of Human Rights. That's one. Second was recognition, apology to the victims of military junta in 1991, 1992. Mostly facilitated domestically. No, very little international involvement. And third one, repatriation, property restitution of Muslim Georgians who were deported by Stalin in 1940s. That's a separate group induced, facilitated, incentivized by Georgia's membership in Council of, Council of Europe. Partially. So these are different groups of population redressed through different means to different degree of effectiveness, you're right. And I, and I would actually think that there's no government which would be strong enough and resourceful enough which would just look at its past in its entirety without periodization and categorization and sense and would apologize for the crimes that it, at it and its predecessors have committed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Dr. Shin, I'm quick. Uh, I'd like to ask more practical questions rather than uh, theoretical questions because while well, I'm curious about your mentioning about the archives made by the Gestapo. So uh, in accordance with international law on state succession, all the archives may uh, belong to the successor states after the reunification or, or sometimes well, situations of state succession may happen. But in case of the, uh, well, Stasi uh, regime, how do you keep these kind of archives without any destroyed or, well, intentional, uh, uh, well, disposal of the archives, which, uh, which has not been collected mm -hmm. by the reunified you know, bureaucracy? We can collect one more question. President Goschler mentioned earlier that the degree of social cohesion in a country of this type where surveillance uh, is uh, so intense, the degree of social cohesion is very low. One, amongst multiple differences between East, East Germany and North Korea, one big difference is that East Germans knew much more about West Germany than North Koreans know about South Korea. However, for the past few years, we have clear evidence that despite the fact that North Korea continues to be the world's most close society, more information has been entering the country via radio broadcast, via USBs, uh, portable media devices, media storage devices, sold at informal small markets that have developed as a coping mechanism after the famine. So my question goes to Dr. Peck from Seoul. What role do you think markets and information, more information are playing, not in creating a civil society in North Korea, but maybe in creating the preconditions for a nascent civil society. And is there anything that can be done now and in the very near future, in particular on the information front, to uh, maybe try and stimulate this process of creating the preconditions for a nascent civil society under the current conditions of North Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I start with the Stasi archive question. So, of, of course, the Stasi tried to destroy records, but uh, it was one of the uh, first uh, actions of uh, civil society movements mm -hmm. uh, to safeguard. Uh, the archives, and of course, some 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 parts were destroyed, um, some parts were uh, rescued, and some parts were uh, sold to the U.S. government, and <laughs> so all in all. <laughs> so the most interesting part, of course, 
<laughs> so the part, uh, the part where you can find the clear names of the agents. <laughs> <laughs> but but so there were uh, civil committees civil committees who tried to protect uh, uh, the files from destruction, and so all in all, about I think 17 kilometers of uh, so so more than 10 miles of uh, 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 files were were kept, and uh, and um, the the destroyed files also were kept. And uh, it, it was a uh, year's work, and they were uh, put together, to, together like, uh, like puzzles. So they were put in uh, machines to tear the paper, and then a special software was developed to, to put together uh, uh, the paper clips, and this was a, uh, a, ca a program where m many people got work by putting together uh, torn <laughs> files for, for years. Yeah? So basically, there's a lot of information kept, and historians are used that they never got uh, everything, but it's enough. Uh, it's more than you can read in your lifetime. <laughs> uh, what kind of factors can stipul stimulate the, the... I think the thing is that to have to increase the way of the exposure, toward the North Korea is important. Like, for, for example, the development of the technology, I think we talked before about the issues like the USB. Before to, to uh, give the information of the outside world, we use the CD, CD ROMs. It's, it's big, but now the USB is very small. And even the, 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 civil, uh, the human rights NGOs who work near the border of the Chinese and North Korea, they first saved some information in the USB and they delete it. And they bring those the USBs to North Korea and they have the good skill of the hacking. So they restore the, the information. So there are some the newly de devices, the technologies help to, to disseminate the information from outside. Also, I also talked with the Rajbal about the KIC, the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which is unfortunately is now closed. But there are 50,000 workers worked in there. And inevitably, they have, can get some information about the South Korea. If we consider their families, it's almost 200,000. So this kind of the interactions with not only the South Korea or some other country, even with the China, I think they can make the room, they can make the possibility and the room for the civil societies to breed in the North Korea. This what I can. Okay, sure, sure. So I would also like to change uh, my role and uh, put a question to my colleague Afada Minsi. Um, I, I'm wondering whether um, there exists uh, a myth of uh, America, uh, of uh, African uh, transitional justice, which is produced by Hollywood movies, that there is this wonderful uh, Ubuntu, and uh, so Africans have such a wise way of dealing with these things, uh, which is much smarter than the Western idea. Uh, and, and maybe this is a, a, a Hollywood myth which has been produced and which has to do something with the old image of the uh, noble savage. Uh, so oh, what do you think you. about that? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, first, it, it wouldn't be an Hollywood myth. I think it would be a Johannesburg or Pretoria myth. Okay. And, uh, but I, I agree that there is a myth of uh, like this, and people are, are starting to see it, but this myth of like the perfect Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Africa, that can be replicated in other countries. But I think it's true there is also that idea that our traditional mechanisms are so much like us, but again, it is a myth. And I think uh, people are uh, increasingly uh, conscious of the fact that these mechanisms are limited, but what is also, uh, I will say, concerning is the fact that African leaders are actually using them mm -hmm. like to protect themselves or to shield themselves from uh, international mechanisms, international standards that uh, uh, call them uh, onto account and be accountability. So it is a myth, and there is a concern that uh, people are using that for their uh, political uh, gains or purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, 
There are uh, millions of forcibly displaced persons in Africa, uh, and some have been deliberately uprooted from their homes on ethnic and other grounds. Uh, and in Georgia, too, there were uh, large numbers of forcibly displaced persons. To what extent has this become a part of transitional justice? Uh, and I did mention the uh, property issue, which would be related in many cases to displacement. Uh, to what extent has forced displacement become an internal displaced in the country or a refugee become part of transitional justice? Uh, thank you. I think there have been uh, cases where the TRC moved uh, to neighboring countries or to displaced communities to collect uh, uh, testimonies. Uh, the Sierra Leone TRC, uh, there was an important Sierra Leone uh, community based in the Gambia, and the, the Sierra Leone Commission uh, traveled to uh, Gambia to collect uh, testimonies from uh, witnesses or victims in, in that country. I think the Liberian TRC also uh, met with uh, Liberian, uh, the Liberian uh, diaspora in the U.S. to collect uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the, their testimonies. So uh, by these examples, I would say that there is uh, uh, that element that is, uh, is uh, taken into account. Uh, I will also say that uh, it's probably... Uh, it's probably also one of the reasons uh, I, I'm thinking of Burundi, where uh, the process will be uh, uh, delayed because there is the, 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 the refugees that are coming back or the internally displaced uh, pe persons who will need to be uh, uh, reinstalled in their, uh, their, their communities or their, their lands. And to, to avoid addressing that issue, which is a, a, a clear concern, uh, it, it can lead to delaying the, 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 the transitional justice mechanism. So it is taken into account, or it has been taken into account to a certain extent, but because the issue is uh, that significant, it has also uh, uh, resulted in delaying some of the processes. Yeah. No, I just want, no, I think I, I wanted to say Georgia is a good example where two, two types of, tra the, the, the demand for t both types of transition converge, a little bit like South Korea where you have this internal mm -hmm. questions and also the questions of dealing with North Korean unification because Georgia has, everything they have listed today is Georgia, uh, Georgia's transition from democracy, uh, from, to, from authoritarianism to the aspiration of democracy, but also we have this question of Abkhazia, mm -hmm. what has happened there, who has committed what, war crimes have been committed, and, and one of the reasons why Georgian government currently is not ready to target the question of transitional justice for, of authoritarianism to democracy is because the other issues will come up as well. These are intertwined. So, so far, this is a very politically sensitive topic. Many people who will raise it will be accused of lack of patriotism. Therefore, it's a, it, it remains on the, on the books. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my name is Jim Delaney uh, from the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, Admiral Dennis Blair, who was the former director of national intelligence here, was writing a book the role of, of militaries around the world in facilitating the transition to democracy. Now, somewhat contrary to what I heard from Dr. Beck, it wasn't the Korean civil society that brought about the democracy in Korea. It was the leadership of the Korean army went into then President Chun de Wan convinced him to allow direct elections to the president. That was the single most important step in enabling civil society to have a role in the transition to the market. But without the then director of the Angi Board, Chang Se Dong, and Chun Ho Yong, who had been of the Rock Army and the so-called, so-called, I say, Butcher of One to convince him, Chun De Wong, to allow direct election to the president. Uh, they would have, the, the, the civil society never would have been given a role in the transition. That's my view, and I think a lot of that will come out in the upcoming book by uh, Admiral Blair. Mm -hmm. 
think he will highlight the Korean army as having done the transition to democracy better than militaries in other countries. Thank you for the comment. Uh, uh, I cannot fully agree with your uh, the the perspectives, but well, I, 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 okay, I, please. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, well, it, it is true that uh, uh, it is the strategic uh, choice made by uh, John Du Wan and uh, Ro Te Wu uh, that made uh, democratic uh, transition uh, possible in Korea. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, it is also true that uh, they were pressured from below, from the society, to step down. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, on the one hand, there was a uh, hard, well, hardliners in the military that uh, who were threatening a uh, coup uh, against the uh, softening of the stances uh, on the part of John Du Wan and uh, the Ro Te Wu. And uh, finally, uh, it was John Du Wan who asked Ro Te Wu, okay, if necessary, you can step over my body. So uh, the, uh, the June 27th uh, declaration was a dramatic political show, staged by, uh, directed by John Du Wan, and uh, the, uh, staged by uh, Ro Te Wu. So uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the uh, declaration uh, preempted uh, the opposition. And uh, of course, uh, the Ro Te Wu could win uh, the presidency only uh, by winning uh, one third of the popular vote. Thank you, uh, Professor Yeongjo. He is actually the former head person, uh, the former chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation. Well, before I uh, be became the uh, president of the TRCK, uh, I was a political scientist. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so I just want to make sure, uh, make the, the audience know that you're the, the person uh, in the TRCK. I want to make short comments on the Actually, they were. Uh, they succeeded in Korea. But in accordance with Maxim, uh, the person who succeeded in Korea will not be convicted if we look at the history. But they were convicted and they were tried by the court in, in Korea. And they, they were convicted as betrayers to Korea. And, and amnesty was given. I will take one more question, yes, please. I'm with the Congressional Research Service. Um, is there anything to be said about the diaspora communities in any of your stories? Do they play a unique role, bring something surprising to the equation? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting thought experiment to think of the millions of Eastern Germans who went to West Germany as a diaspora. Yeah, so I'm yeah, just yeah. wondering if you could go on <laughs> and think about them that way. <laughs> and so uh, the GDR created its own diaspora, throwing many people out of the country. Okay, well, probably the other guys have more interesting stories to tell about the role of the diaspora. Okay. Uh, concerning the role of the diaspora, I think I will uh, base my comments on all what I've heard since uh, yesterday. And I, I have the impression, I may be wrong, that a change uh, in North Korea may also come from the diaspora. And the question that I actually had was, uh, like, what, what critical mass needs to be uh, reached for that diaspora to be able to play a role in, in, in North Korea? I don't know. I think uh, we heard about fellows uh, coming from North Korea, uh, mm -hmm. being trained, uh, the, the defectors uh, going to uh, South Korea. I have the impression that uh, it, it will be through the diaspora that uh, change may be uh, arising in, in North Korea. 
In terms of uh, Africa, I think the diaspora has certainly uh, played a role if in some of those uh, transitional justice processes. The diaspora, uh, because of their exposure, because of training, and it's through the influence that they uh, will have on the national context to probably promote one or the other of the transitional justice mechanism. And uh, if we are talking about the diaspora in general and not uh, necessarily linked to transitional justice process, uh, like the idea that I have in mind and which uh, uh, comes immediately is the role uh, the, the Somali diaspora is playing in the overall uh, stabilization and peace building uh, in the country. So diaspora certainly plays a role in transitional justice, but in peace building more generally. Yeah, from the region, Georgians unfortunately don't, do not have uh, diaspora, which has a long history, it's relatively recent, it's not organized, it's not mobilized, and it's not resourceful. But a good example from the region is Armenian diaspora, mm -hmm. which and its role and its influence on driving the processes of reconciliation facing the past uh, of, the, of the Turkish, uh, of the Armenian genocide in the beginning of 20th century. Right? So I think I look at this processes very well, and I see the differences. We are both small, very small countries, neighboring, but the Armenian diaspora, the way it's organized, it has a really long history of being in the United States and Western Europe, and, and its influence is, is um, proportionately strong. Well, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and the various Yugoslav groups here in this country played a pretty active role vis-a-vis -vis the American government uh, through the 90s, although I don't know, know it well enough to know whether in the case of the Czechs and the Slovaks, they were ended up being a, a force that helped encourage the the velvet divorce rather than rather than unification. But they they do have a big role. They did have a big role. They do have a big role in in the United States. You know, particularly the Poles, the United States and the United States politics. Younger. <coughs> I, w I would like to add something to this. Uh, time is over? Over, please. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we can see that uh, since the 1990s, uh, a universal model of reconciliation and compensation uh, emerged, with, which, wa which took as a, uh, as a model uh, the Jewish case. And so there was a a successful case and other groups tried to copy this case. So uh, recently I was a, uh, at an Armenian conference and there were lawyers who told me, well, they just took uh, the, the Jewish cases and replaced Jewish by Armenians because they knew this worked. Uh, and, and I think... Uh, we can see this in, in, in many places. We can see that a, a kind of uh, a global discourse has, has emerged uh, which is suitable for very distinctive cases and that many minority groups or diaspora groups are using this uh, universalized discourse for several dis uh, pur purposes and uh, the language is always the same but uh, the, the histories behind are, are different. Thank you. And now we are close the session for thank you so much and thank you.